Welcome to Search the Scriptures. Today we are on study number nine in John's Gospel in our three-year journey marching through the Word of God. And study nine in the book of John covers chapter number five, verse one through verse 29. I love the story in this passage of Scripture. I'm going to talk about it in a way today maybe that you haven't thought of before. I think it's fascinating what happens in this passage. Jesus comes to a pool, pool at Bethesda, and it's said that at this pool from time to time the waters are stirred. There's this belief that an angel comes and stirs the waters. And if you are one of the first ones down into the water, when the waters begin to stir, then you will be healed. And as Jesus comes along this pool, he finds a man that's lying there, and according to the Word of God here in John chapter 5 and verse number 5, one who, who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. For 38 years, this man had been an invalid. And it says in the sixth verse, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition, for a long time. Notice it doesn't say here since birth, just for a long time. He asked him, do you want to get well? I think that's an interesting question. Have you ever met anybody that you really deep down didn't think wanted to get well? I have. A lot of people don't want to get well. They'd rather be sick. They'd rather not work anymore. They'd rather stay home. They'd rather get a lot of attention from a lot of other people. They'd rather people's lives center around them and caring for their needs rather than their lives centering around the needs of others. And I wonder if this man wasn't that type of a person that really didn't want to get well. I think Jesus may have seen something like this in this man. And when this man is asked this question about Jesus, by Jesus, he doesn't say, well, of course I want to get well. Why would I want to be like this? Instead, he offers up an excuse. He says, he says to Jesus, well, sir, verse 7, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. So it's like this blame game. Well, I can't do anything about it because of my condition. And yet I wonder, how do you get to the pool every day? I mean, for 38 years, somehow, some way, somebody, there was some means of him getting to the place that he was at every day. Now, I think if it were me, I would hope at least, if I've been 38 years in a condition like that, that some, at some point over that 38 years, I would have found a way to get close to the pool. I mean, right? I mean, he would surely have seniority among the invalids there. And 38 years of time would have gotten a front row seat for the stirring of the waters. And if you could get close enough, I would just say, lay me right beside it. Lay me down on the first step. Lay me at the water's edge so that when the water stirs, I don't need any help. I'll just flop myself over until I can get into the water and be healed. But it seems as if this man preferred to be where the people passed. He wanted to be, of course, where he could beg from the people as they came along. So that's how he sustained his life. So Jesus, it's interesting to me, after this man offers this excuse, Jesus doesn't even ask him if he wants to be healed anymore. He just says here in verse number 8, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now you may say, well, Pastor Troy, I, I, just, I just can't see Jesus having a conversation like this. You're going, you're going way far afield here of how I've ever heard of this story before. Well, let's get to the rest of the story. Let's get to the end of the story here and see what happens. The Jews are upset. The religious leaders are upset 
uh, that they see this man carrying his mat on the Sabbath. And they, they come across him and they rebuke him in the middle of the 10th verse. It is the Sabbath, they say. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Now, once again, he's trying to put the blame on somebody else. Has he put the blame on not being put into the pool because nobody was there or people jumped ahead of him in line? He says, wait, but in verse 11, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So it's not my fault. Somebody else told me to do it. And they said, who, who, who told you? Where's he at? He said, well, I don't know. He couldn't point Jesus out because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. Now, that's not how the story ends. It says that later on, Jesus found this man at the temple. Now, I want you to hear what Jesus said when he found this man at the temple. Verse number 14. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Wow, what a statement. I mean, perhaps this man wasn't lifting his hands in worship or offering a sacrifice at the temple. Jesus finds him at the temple and he says, so I see you're well. Why don't you stop sinning? I wonder what he was doing at the temple. You know, after 38 years of laying beside the pool and considering Jesus' question to him at the beginning, do you even want to be healed? Considering the man's response, well, it's not my fault. After all, people jump ahead of me in line, you know, etc., etc., etc. And then Jesus comes to him and says, uh, I see you're well. Why don't you stop sinning? Kind of makes me wonder if the man hadn't exchanged his mat for a, for a, a white cane with a red tip and dark sunglasses. And maybe he was at the front of the temple trying to do what the only thing he knew to do, the only thing he was accustomed to do, what he had done for his whole life been a beggar. Because see, after 38 years of not having a trade, after 38 years of not doing anything, after 38 years of having hands that didn't have calluses on them from working in a field, now all of a sudden this man's life was turned upside down and the, what he depended on before wasn't there anymore. And Jesus comes to him, sees him at the temple and says, stop sinning or something worse might happen to you. Now, I'm sure that you probably haven't thought about that story in that way before, but I just encourage you to read it again and see if that isn't possibly what Jesus is getting at. And listen to the response of this man after Jesus says this to him. And this is why I think the story really unfolds in this way. When Jesus says to him, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you, listen to verse 15. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. In other words, he went after the people. He went to find the people to turn Jesus in. It's as if he went straight to the cops to say, that guy right there. Before he couldn't pick Jesus out of a lineup, now he was bound and determined to go and to bring the police to Jesus. He knew Jesus was going to get in trouble. He know that, knew that those guys didn't have any good intentions. He knew that they weren't going to put Jesus on television and, and proclaim his glory and how wonderful a person he was. He knew their agenda. And it seems as if that he was a little upset at the rebuke that Jesus had given him. And he goes and he points him out and says, that guy right there is the one that told me to pick up my mat. Well, the Jews come to Jesus. They find him. And they're rather upset, and they begin to talk to him about the Sabbath. Why do you tell people to do work on the Sabbath? And things such as this. And Jesus' response is this in verse 17. My father is always at his work. To this very day, I too am working. Now, their laws regarding work on the Sabbath all go all the way back to Genesis chapter number 2, when it says God rested on the Sabbath day, and he blessed it, and he made it holy. And he made it as a day for our, us to all rest because he rested from all his work on creation on that day. Yet Jesus seemingly, seemingly contradicts that when he says, my father is always at his work to this very day. I want you to remember, it really in Genesis chapter 2, it doesn't say that God quit working. It says that God's work of creation stopped. 
God is always working on our behalf. God is never resting from his work of sowing, his work of harvest, his work of blessing, his work of answering our prayers. He is always busy in our lives. Sabbath was made for the man, not man, not man for the Sabbath. And when Jesus had said that about my father is always busy at his work. Oh my, the Jews were tremendously upset about that. And it says in verse 18, for this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill, to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, I love what unfolds after this. Jesus was not the slightest bit interested in political correctness. Not a bit. He wasn't the slightest bit interested in keeping peace among these uh, people that were constantly trying to kill him. He wasn't trying to, you know, play it cool at all. When they were so upset, and he knew they were so upset that he called God his father, Jesus launches into a discourse from verse 19 all the way through verse number 30. And in this discourse, when they are upset that he called God Father and he called himself the Son, he says, Father, 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 Son, 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 Son. He says, Father, nine, eight times and Son, nine times. He doesn't back down from the fight. He makes it clear that, no, you did not misunderstand me. No, I am not apologizing. I meant exactly what I said. And in case you didn't get it, let me say it again. Not just once, not just twice, not just three times, but eight times. Let me call him my father. You know, we live in a day and age where people back down from everything. When they say something and, and somebody doesn't agree with it or it may cause their ratings to drop in the polls just a little bit, there is an immediate outcry for an apology and people go to microphones and hold press conferences to apologize. I'm thankful that I serve a God that wasn't apologetic. When he made a claim to the truth, he stuck to that claim. Friends, in this day and age, we need to be as bold as Jesus was. We need to those people that really don't want to get well. We just need to ask them, do you even want to get better? And when they go back to their old ways, we need to say, look, you better straighten up or something worse is even going to happen to you. And when we get in hot water because we hold to God's word, let's not back down from it. When people get upset at us for saying things that God's word proclaims, maybe may we be just like Jesus. They would say, Father, 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 Son, 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 and not back down. Because the truth is what sets us free. I hope this study was interesting to you today. I hope it causes you to just think, man, maybe I better go back and read this. I'm not too sure I follow what was being said here today. I hope you get a blessing as you dig into God's Word. God's Word blesses me, and I hope it blesses you. I hope you're having a great day so far, and may God richly bless the rest of your day.